Live from Vienna, Austria, it's theCUBE. Covering .next Europe 2016, brought to you by Nutanix. Here's your host, Stu Miniman. Welcome back to theCUBE, the worldwide leader in enterprise technology co uh, coverage. Happy to welcome back to the program a multi-time guest, uh, the CEO of Nutanix, Dheeraj Pandey. Thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. And, and thank you for bringing us to Vienna here. Uh, Dheeraj, over 1,300 people here, um, you know, obviously from a lot of different countries. Uh, you know, general excitement uh, in the air. Uh, to tell us where your mind's at. Well, I mean, uh, you know, we've always been a global company about, uh, for the last couple of years, we've had about 35% of our business come from outside the U.S. So bringing the event to uh, Europe was actually a big deal for us, and we said, let's just go and, you know, be a company that's global, but, you know, acting locally as well. So uh, I'm just exhilarated just to see the response and uh, the love that customers actually have, and hopefully the hope that prospects have for this uh, company. Okay, can you speak a little bit to kind of both your company and how you partner? How do you reach that, that global audience and especially uh, in Europe? So we have uh, employees in 40 countries, but we ship to 90 countries already. And a lot of that is happening because of the channel and the you know, distribution strategy that we actually have. Um, obviously, the OEMs are doing some of this as well. So Dell is doing it, Lenovo is doing it, and our reseller partners do it as well. So uh, I think a combination of distribution through OEMs and distribution and reseller relationships with the bars is helping us a lot. All right, so you know you talked about in the keynote this morning. You know the IPO went. Uh, you know there's a lot of changes. Everybody's watching. Uh, you know all, all the pieces. Uh, you know happening with Nutanix. Uh, and they, they, when I talked to Sunil this morning, it was kind of you know wrapping up phase one. Or you know so still plenty of work to do in phase one, obviously with Hyperconverge. But uh, going to phase two. Um, we, 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 I spoke with you a few weeks back uh, to talking about kind of the post IPO. But just kind of the state of the company, uh, maturation. Of the company, what, 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 what's your take on where we are and where we're going? Basically? Well, the next uh, six to eight quarters, it's you know heads down, execution, both on R&D side as well as sales and marketing side. You know, in some level, obviously the public market investor is going to expect a lot from us in the next two years. And uh, we also have to uh, basically establish our identity, because you know obviously when you do this kind of an operating system work, it's very hard to put you in a category, you know, are you a compute company, a storage company, a hypervisor company, or are you getting networking, what does that mean? So in that sense, we have a lot of hard work ahead in terms of defining our overall category. And uh, hyperconverge to me is basically a very inane word, I mean, it means nothing really. I mean, to say that we can go and solve real problems for people, do it faster, quicker than anybody else, and reduce the OPEX is probably where the real delight lies. So, uh, you know, looking at, and I've, you know, we've co-designed this uh, Wall Street Journal ad with the rest of the team. And there's obviously VMware, there's Amazon, where do we fit in? And uh, it's a pretty wide gap that we need to go and define. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, if we've talked about it a few times, but uh, the first time we interviewed you, uh, I think it was over four years ago now, it was talked about, you know, the computer science issue of our day is to talking about distributed architectures. Um, and that's not a converged or even hyper-converged issue. It's a, it's a much bigger, you know, kind of, it's, it's, it's a software problem. And that's the, at the core, the, the, the core of your engineering team, the core of, you know, your background. Um, and so, is that, are you just a software company at the end of the day? Or, you know, what, 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 what is Nutanix uh, when, it, when it's fully grown up? I think you uh, rightly mentioned the uh, distributed systems part of it. Because many of these uh, hyper-converged solutions, they're using mostly VMware and then replacing a bit of it and adding their own little color to it. Uh, and then we are saying we need to redefine the control plane and redefine the data plane, you know, redefine the abstractions of drag and drop from one stack to another. So there's a lot of work that's going on which uses commodity servers and distributed computing uh, methodologies to go and build these solutions actually on top. I mean, today as you saw from uh, the keynote, um, looks like it's echoing a little bit. Um, from the keynote that customers are actually looking for solutions that actually work at scale, and uh, working at scale would require you to really go and use the power of multiple machines and still be able to deliver the facade of a single system. 
So at the core, this company is really a software company, but we are also very mindful of how not to throw software over the wall. Because that's what a lot of software companies do. They try to optimize for the Wall Street model, as opposed to optimizing for the customer model, where Wall Street model will actually take care of itself. Yeah, so it sounds more like uh, the discussions I have when I talk to the hyperscale companies. It's the Googles and Amazons of the world. That, that's the mindset that they have, as opposed to, um, you know, I'm an infrastructure guy by background, but that's kind of the traditional enterprise and uh, you know, hardware-centric view of things. Yeah, you're always trying to classify a company as a software company or a hardware company or an appliance company Services, or some other company. Yeah. But what does Main Street want? Not what Wall Street wants, but what Main Street wants is abstract it out, make it invisible, make it simple, and it doesn't matter how. Because you, we don't ask this question to a cloud company, like, hey, how, are you a hardware company or software company? It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we are delivering solutions that make our customers' lives easier. So the IPO, the timing of that was something you needed to sort out. Um, we're in uncertain times in global, the global economic markets. Um, how does that impact you know, how you run the company and how the company you know, moves forward? Well, so definitely a few things have happened in the last two, three years, and not just in the US, but with Brexit, a pretty close Austrian elections, and uh, what uh, probably we'll see with local elections in Germany and other such places. Uh, people are questioning, okay, we talked about globalization, and it actually has uh, an impact on you know, flow of people and trade and goods and all this stuff across the world. But what about me? You know, what about my job and my standard of living and things like that? So it definitely uh, brings to focus that uh, localization of globalization. You know, I mean, I, I, and we say this all the time, it's also a cliched uh, thing to say that you think global but act local. And a little bit of that is showing up in terms of the rebellion from people saying this globalization thing is not localized and it's not empathetic to who I am and what my job is and so on. So you'll see countries actually hunker down a little bit you know, and trying to say, look, we overdid globalization. We need to start thinking about our own people as well. And just like you know, it happened with uh, farming, you know, like a lot of people are saying farmer's market and local produce and things like that. Some of that will happen with uh, consumer goods and even technology to a certain extent. And the idea of cloud computing will also get a nuance in this because there are 150 countries, and I talked about this uh, in my presentation as well, that at the end of the day, it's, if it's like power, if it's like water, if it's like gas, if it's utility, you just can't have only 100 data centers or 200 data centers around the world. You'd have thousands and tens of thousands of data centers around the world because the SLAs are actually quite complex. You know, there's not just five nines availability, it's security, compliance, data safe harbor, you know, on and on and on. So this idea of seeding the cloud at a smaller local level to me actually becomes even more relevant in this new world. And it's it's it transcends beyond the US elections, it's just across the board. I think people don't realize that there is a, a very complex pulse of computing, uh, notwithstanding all this stuff about who owns the data, who owns the uh, rights to the information and, and the application and things like that. It just makes up for the case of how cloud companies will have to miniaturize their operating system. Like Azure is talking about an appliance. There's rumors of uh, and Amazon talking about an appliance and so on. So everybody will have to coexist in an appliance world in, in two racks as well as in 2,000 racks. So have you built an operating system that also works in two racks versus just 20,000 racks itself? Yeah, we, we talked a little bit uh, this morning with Sunil about in 2017, you know, Microsoft's expected to ship you know, Azure Stack uh, and we will see the VMware on Amazon uh, solution and you know, I'll, I'll be at Amazon reInvent later this month. We'll see, you know, how, how many straws does Amazon stick in the data centers and uh, you know, are there some appliances that end up getting there, uh, to being there. Um, you know, different set of competitors than the traditional you know, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, IBM, uh, Oracle, who you, know, you partner with, but, but there. Look, you mean today the hyper-converged vendors, they say that they compete with Nutanix, but they all need the entire stack. Cisco and HP and a lot of these companies at the end of the day are hardware companies. And they, they go and take an entire VMware stack and then replace a bit of the storage component and put their own little thing. But they still need the hypervisor, the container stack, the 
uh, you know, operations management stack, the systems management, and all that stuff around it. Software defined networking, security, things like that. I mean, at some level, we are building an operating system, and if anything, we are a little bit of a lesser operating system because we think that we have to also make it a little non-nerdy, non-geeky. You know, thinking about credit cards and subscription and spot pricing and app store, you know, those metaphors of e-commerce have to meld into the operating system definition itself so that it's not just about compute and storage and virtualization, we have a very bottom-up view of technology as opposed to thinking top-down about the end user, the developer, the app administrator, folks who actually don't care what a hypervisor is and what fiber channel is and what iSCSI is and what NFS and so on. Yeah, that's interesting. I, the question I was thinking of is, if you ask customers, you know, the, the, the old maxim, if you know, uh, Henry Ford said, if we had asked our customers what they want, they wanted you know better buggy whips and you know faster horses and the like. Um, if I go to a, you know an enterprise IT, yes, they want simpler environments. Obviously, that that's pretty easy. But you know, a micro segmentation on the security and the networking. I mean, it, I look at the areas that you guys are adding to. What is the driver? What's kind of the true north of the company to kind of set as to where your direction is versus? Uh, you know, how much are you getting the feedback from the customers? I think as Rajiv said, you know, when the customers ask for it, it should be there, not, you know, the mm -hmm. even six, 12, or 18 months, you know, delivery cycle once they yeah, ask for yeah. something. Well, uh, one thing is that we have to think about the end user. The consumer of uh, infrastructure is not the infrastructure admin. The consumer is a developer. The consumer is an app administrator. And uh, they're thinking about apps. They're not thinking about VLANs and load balancer rules and firewall rules or a VM or a container. They're thinking about the whole thing. And that's the blueprint. They want to clone and provision and migrate and backup and you know, do all sorts of verbs on this one noun. And the noun is not these disparate components of a fiber channel zone and a VLAN and a you know, load balancing uh, switch or a, a rule and so on and so forth. So when you bring it all together into an application specification, now it becomes really interesting because now when you provision an app, the firewall should get pre-programmed automatically, the load balancer should be pre-programmed, the network should get programmed. So there's the, the real true north for Nutanix is what would an app need and how would the app user think about using these different elements, which is networking or security and storage and uh, compute and things like that. You know? And in that sense, all we're trying to do is to make infrastructure more consumable, not by folks who are specialists in their own little area, who get a ticket and they actually go and work on the ticket and it takes weeks of round trip to get the ticket resolved for the entire app to be provisioned, but instead, how do you automate the heck out of it such that you don't even need to file a ticket because a developer can consume these things unbeknownst of what these things really do and, and how do they get implemented. How much does your team need to get into the weeds of the application? I heard announcements about SAP and Oracle, you had Citrix up on stage, um, or how much of it is the kind of you know, puppet chef, you know, those kind of things where I can identify a workload uh, and then just use you as a platform? Well, so uh, the automation APIs definitely you know, belong uh, to us because we actually talk about what are the things we want to actually make configurable and programmable, which is what the APIs do. And then on top of the APIs, you definitely can use you know, any kind of uh, plugin framework, uh, Python binding, uh, Ruby binding, and use your favorite configuration management system. It could be a Puppet, for example. And uh, maybe that CMDB belongs in ServiceNow, or maybe it belongs in Puppet, or what have you. And they can be the Uber orchestrators and the Uber configuration managers. But then we want to at least do a good job of not being a heterogeneous orchestrator, a heterogeneous configuration database, but just for our own little ecosystem, can we manage the best configuration management, configuration, and can we be the best orchestrator, actually? So that then the Uber orchestrators can work on top of us and uh, you know, automate Nutanix and something else along with it. Maybe there's Nutanix, AHV, and VMware. Maybe it's some Cisco Blades and Nutanix together, because eventually people are looking at something that's Uber, uh, orchestrator as opposed to just a Nutanix specific domain itself.
At the, uh, at the Vegas show, it talked about the, the Newton Nation. Um, as you're now a public company, uh, we were talking off camera a little bit about you know, companies that need to be careful about going from the insurgent to the incumbent. Um, does how you hire, how you train your people as you grow, you know, does that change? It's got to be tough to still get, you know, as we said, getting that first hundred people in the valley uh, you know, is easy. You know, getting your next thousand uh, you know, and keeping that high quality is, is really tough. Uh, you know, how does the culture change as you get larger? Well, uh, you know, we have to keep uh, evolving with scale because um, obviously the the intent is the same. The intent is to be a politics-free, insurgent mentality company that has, you know, owners as opposed to employees work for. A, and then finally, the obsession for the end customer, the front line, is equally important. So that that is the intent, whether with a hundred people or five hundred people or a thousand people. How you get to that intent is what changes because at scale, you need to go and uh, really make the grassroots fabric become kind of shockproof and scale proof and stuff like that. So that problem definitely is becoming harder in that sense. And uh, as you said, you know, you know, there's this paradox of growth where you know, growth creates complexity and complexity kills growth. And I think one of the challenges that the company faces is how do you buck the trend of being yet another company that you know, probably reached its whatever billion dollar revenue and then it completely petered away. What are the ways in which you can continue to grow the serviceable TAM? What are the ways in which you can keep the same net promoter score? Because customer support and customer satisfaction at scale is a very hard problem, very difficult problem actually. You know? So having that culture, that mentality of you know, end customers matter, employee manager relationships matter, and eventually everybody is a customer. You know, we say this uh, all the time, I say this, that HR's customers are every employee in the company. So if you have a net promoter score mentality, whether it's internal employees or external customers or partners, I think good things can happen. Speaking of the maturity of the company, another thing you talked about uh, in the keynote was the Nutanix Health, uh, I'm sorry, Nutanix Heart uh, initiative that you have. Maybe explain a little bit about that and you know, what, what, what are the causes that you know, get you excited personally? Well, uh, I think <laughs> as a company matures and as we have a little bit more self-actualizing oxygen, you know, we need to think about not just the business and the gross margin and the strength of the PL and the balance sheet and things like that. So like what is really good business? And I think really good business is if you also get connected to the society, the community at large. <coughs> and Dot Heart actually makes us a more robust company because. Um, Could you just explain yeah, what the program is? Exactly. Yeah. So, it's it's uh, basically uh, a true north for the company to say, look, we try to have a culture of humility and hunger and honesty, but how about giving as well? What does giving mean to us? What does giving mean for individual employees? What does uh, volunteer time off look like so that employees can really go and do things on their own? What does it mean for the company to contribute to causes? Not the least of which is its own gene pool. For example, how do you think of diversity? How do you think of women in tech? How do you think of women in our own company? And we probably haven't done a, the best of jobs to actually hire women at scale. Or even have leaders, I mean, like for example, my reports, none of them are women, so I have to do a better job of that. We have to do a better job of the company where women can look up. Uh, to leaders in the company and say, I want to be that, actually. You know? So, in that sense, we are still very vulnerable and we have to get better at those things. And a program like this also reminds us to say, before we go and try to do this thing better for the society and the local schools and things like that, can we do better for ourselves as well? You know? and, and that overall creates a very robust, uh, you know, a very diverse gene pool that the company can withstand shocks and have uh, employees who are not just loyal but willing to question and you know basically go back to this uh, bucking the trend of uh, complexity and, and the growth that uh, the complexity that comes with growth itself. And, and part of that, my understanding is you're reaching out to local communities to to get things that are involved. Uh, Silicon Valley, you know, is always a discussion. Any, anything back home uh, that that you're making sure that the the, the team focuses on when yeah, it comes think, to the uh, community involvement. <coughs> One of the uh, things that we observe is 
why aren't there enough women in tech? And people always point back to schools and colleges saying, you know, there are not enough uh, women and girls graduating. So we are focusing on what does it mean to hire more women from universities and how do you go back to local schools and see if you can actually go and teach people, uh, and not just people, but girls in particular. We are trying to associate ourselves with girls who code. Uh, and so programs like that which go and try to fix the problem upstream as opposed to question why the problem exists downstream itself. You know? All right, uh, I remember back, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think it was, it was Miami at the first .next conference. You talked about you know, your various constituents and hinted that you'd have the new one, the financial services. So as final, final note, could you just walk through kind of you know, your employees, you know, your customers, your partners, and the financial. What do you want them taking away from uh, th this event that you've had, uh, where Nutanix is and where they're going? Well, uh, for the employees, customers, and partners, it is the fact that we are trying to get more empathy for them. That's why localization matters. That's why coming here matters. That's why talking to, because EMEA is a large world in itself. Europe by itself is not homogeneous. It's like, you know, you know, tens of countries, there's Middle East, there's Africa, which is another continent by itself, there's Russia, which looks like a continent by itself, a world by itself. So to understand each of these countries and constituencies it requires a lot of, uh, you know, doing events like these, actually. So that's what this idea of let's get empathy for Germany and France and Portugal and Spain and every little country that we can think of is very important for us. And for, I think for Wall Street, uh, I think it's going to take care of itself. I really believe that if we did right by, by our employees, if we did it right by our customers and partners, then um, you know in the long run, I've said this before, uh, stock market is extremely fair, extremely fair. In the short run, nobody controls because the mob controls, but in the long run, a lot of uh, goodness emerges. If you as a company are, have the right hygiene, uh, have the right guardrails, avoid waste, you know, the, a lot of stuff is about wastage. When you grow big, you try to do too many things, you don't fail fast enough, you don't cut things fast enough, you're not making tougher decisions because you end up becoming a soft company. You know, I, I talk about uh, soft, the word soft is equally important to us now at scale because you have soft products that don't sell, you know, that's waste. You have soft talent that you're not trying to manage out. Uh, you're making softer decisions in the interview process because you're trying to be a nice company. Um, and um, I think you just have a soft culture where you are not willing to stand up to the inequities and uh, the inefficiencies that actually come to exist. So in all little ways, I think what Wall Street helps you do is become and continue to stay a tough company where you can continue to make tough decisions. And if you keep doing those things in a hygienic way, then. The share price takes care of itself, actually. Oh, dear Raj, it's always a pleasure to be able to talk with you. Really appreciate you having uh, the queue be able to be here at the inaugural event. Uh, and I, I agree, the world could definitely use uh, some more empathy uh, as we go forward. So thank you pleasure. much for joining us. We'll be back with lots more coverage here from the Nutanix. First, .next in Europe. You're watching the queue.